many of you recognize this sound? What is it? Typewriter. How many of you actually learned how to type on a typewriter? You're old. <laughs> I am also kind of old. I'm, I'm 40. I learned how to type on an Underwood number 5, 1920s vintage, just like this one, when I was 10 years old. I used to hunt and peck for the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, and I would try to type out song lyrics for music videos while I watched MTV. I remember very vividly the smell of the ink and the grease from the typewriter and the soreness of my fingers and arms after a long session of typing. I uh, always looked at the typewriter as something that looked alive or as if it had been born in a mad scientist's laboratory. People have been using typewriters for about 140 years. Countless masterworks of literature and music were written on them. Every household, office, hospital, courtroom, and school had typewriters in it. Women entered the workforce in huge numbers at the beginning of the last century uh, as typists, which helped take them from here to here in a couple of generations. Many generations learned how to put words and information on paper by typing. At home, we typed poetry, recipe cards, and letters to distant friends and family. Thousands of man hours went into the design and manufacture of typewriters, and they were often at the forefront of industrial design and engineering. And typewriter advertisements were often at the cutting edge of graphic design. Manufacturers of the typewriter year after year, in competition with their competitors, other models, tried to make their machines more efficient and more beautiful. They're sturdy, they're ingeniously engineered, and they're beautiful machines that embody a personal and very visceral relationship with the machine in the 20th century. I destroy typewriters. <laughs> I sit down cross-legged on the floor, just like here, with my screwdrivers and pliers and other tools. And I back out screws, I unfasten sc springs, I pull out pins. I very gently kill them until all that remains of them is a pile on the floor and a cast iron carcass in my hands. I eviscerate them utterly. Why would I do that? <laughs> After what I just said, why would I do that? When I was 10 years old and learning how to type on that Underwood, I was mesmerized by the beauty and of, of the machinery inside the typewriter. I would lay alongside the typewriter and hit a key and watch the motion of the linkage, all the linkages of the typewriter, all the way up to the paper. And I thought it looked very much like the workers in Fritz Lang's Metropolis, working under the city, the planes flying through the city. And I very much wanted to fly through the typewriter and watch it working as I hit the keys. And I also very much wanted, like any 10-year-old would, to take it apart. But it was still a useful appliance in my household, so that was something that would have landed me in a bit of trouble. About 10 years later, I was living in a little town called Fairfield, Iowa, and I was doing such varied work as package design and stained glass restoration. This is a window that I actually completely disassembled and re while I worked in a stained glass studio. And I was also working for established sculptors, working on large-scale public art projects. Uh, I was casting anatomical models and Hindu deities, among other things. I was working on my own work in my studio at the time. I was uh, into sci-fi, fantasy, what I called sort of techno-baroque. And it was about this time that somebody handed me an Olivetti Laterra 32 portable typewriter 
and asked me if I could please bring it to the thrift store. I wasn't going to bring that thing to the thrift store. Here was my chance. I was going to scratch a decade-long itch and take this typewriter apart. So I gleefully sat down, cross-legged, just like you saw earlier, and completely took that little thing apart until there was nothing left but typewriter guts and bones. And this was a very exciting moment for me. Uh, I felt like a shaman practicing some sort of divination with the parts. I was pushing them around, very carefully placing them. And I realized that the whole mess looked a lot like an erector set, which I played a lot with as a kid. And I also noticed that the parts themselves looked a lot like the drawings I'd been working on. So I made this goofy little dog here. And <laughs> I showed it to a lot of artist friends. And I got a very, uh, the most common response I got was a very polite, oh, very nice. I was a little riled by that lukewarm response. I knew I could do better than the goofy little dog. So I began collecting typewriters in earnest. I got them dirt cheap at yard sales and thrift stores, and I would go to neighboring towns to typewriter repair shops and pick them up there. After a few weeks of taking apart dirty, greasy, cobweb, and spider-filled typewriters, I started making some mechanical insects and little creatures and people and now, 17 years later, this is what I've been doing. Full-scale, anatomically representative, nude human figures and parts of the anatomy. I think maybe you can tell I'm a, a big Lord of the Rings fan for my haircut right here. <laughs> this is my studio. Uh, the shelves where I keep the typewriters are on deck. I call it death row. Uh, there's a deer that I did recently. Uh, I actually work this fast. <laughs> I, I wish. This is actually a, a motion control time lapse shot over the course of about 40 minutes in my studio while I was working on this piece here. Uh, maybe what you don't see is that I keep the, the typewriter parts themselves after I take the typewriter apart in uh, typewriter cases. This piece here is called Bust 5 or Grandfather. It's a self-portrait. <laughs> I made some rules for myself when I started doing this that I would not solder, weld, or glue these assemblages together. I would only use parts that came from the typewriter. I didn't use wire. Uh, I don't use uh, parts from adding machines or cash registers or any similar type of machinery, just typewriters. And maybe you can imagine how long that might take, this piece here is called Nude 4, or Delilah, and she took about 1,200 hours to complete. Uh, if she stood up, she'd be about 6 foot 4, and she has a variety from about 40 typewriters in her. This is another bust that I made. This is the piece I'm working on right now in my studio. Uh, it's a commission. Uh, the guy who commissioned me inherited three typewriters from his father, his late father, and I'm to make a portrait of his father from those same typewriters. And this is a hand over my hand. Maybe you can tell that I love typewriters, even though I love them inside out. I have to say, though, that I do enjoy destroying them. There's a certain part of me that, that feels like I'm following through with a, a ritual that's undoing the mistakes of generations past. I mentioned earlier that women entered the workforce at the turn of the last century, but they were also uh, enslaved by the typewriter. They didn't make very much money in male-dominated workplaces with no chance for upward mobility. And the manufacturing practices of typewriter manufacturers were very toxic. They used toxic materials, and they had kids working for them. 
up until about the 30s. And I'm not really much of a nostalgic person. I'm, I, I wouldn't think of these as the good old days. So there's a part of me that wants to, to wreck these things as much as I love them. There's a great quote by Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher and logician, and he said, machines are worshipped because they are beautiful and valued because they confer power. They are hated because they are hideous and loathed because they impose slavery. And this sums up very elegantly my love-hate relationship with the typewriter. Though I have to say my interest in them is mostly in their beauty and their value. When I consider uh, the time in which the typewriter was invented, uh, the inventors of the typewriter had a very close connection to nature. They had uh, less sophisticated education, which was more multidisciplinary. And they rode horses, and they had farms, and they were just much closer to nature. The machinery they were making uh, had us in it. They put us into it. It was an object of desire that create, or they were creating. It was something that we had to relate to and want. And they use natural materials in them. There's natural rubber, uh, sand, cotton, wood, and even leather. And uh, the actual scale of the typewriter, if you think about the scale, your hands dictate the width of the typewriter. And the typewriter is only big enough to carry, so it's directly proportional to our anatomy, which allows me to make human proportion. And the actual process of the keys themselves are a mirror process of the fingers that push them, like you can see right here. An intact typewriter all by itself before I get to it looks like a face all by itself. It looks like a menacing creature with a toothy grin. I feel very fortunate to have been born in the 70s. It's a really magical time to be a human being. Um, I was born in rural northern Minnesota. I had a very simple upbringing. Uh, through my 20s, I watched technology advance rapidly. And now uh, the transition is advancing exponentially. It's a really exciting time to be alive, and it's a really exciting transition that we're going through as people. And I feel like the typewriter is the symbol of this transition. It reminds us of our past and maybe something we should retain for our future. And it, it shows us who we've been and what we are now. I encourage you all to consider what it is in your life, what ideas or objects have been with you throughout your life and how they might be repurposed to lend even more meaning to you beyond their intended use. Thank you.